Great. Hello. Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to today's webinar. I am Bethany Hamilton with the National Center for Medical Legal Partnership. We want to thank everyone for joining us today to have a really important discussion about how we can work together by collaborating to address the health and legal needs of patients experiencing intimate partner violence and exploitation. I'm from NCMLP. This is a joint venture that we are taking on to provide training uh, support for the HRSA um, uh, health center program part and partners uh, such as legal aid partners and DV advocates. Um, so on this, we are joined by health partners on IPV and exploitation who have really been leading the charge um, on work uh, to help health centers address the needs of survivors um, of intimate partner violence and uh, exploitation. Um, so I wanna sincerely thank our partners for joining us um, on providing this training and technical assistance program today, April 21st, 2022. Let's go to the next slide. I'll pass it on to Elena to tell you about health partners on IPV and exploitation. Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining us. My name is Elena Josue. I'm from Futures Without Violence and work on our project Health Partners on IPV and Exploitation, a training and technical assistance program funded by the Health Resources and Services Administration. You can find out more about our program on our website listed below healthpartnersipve.org and look forward to sharing more throughout the program. Thanks, Elena. And as I mentioned, I'm Bethany Hamilton, co-director at the National Center for Medical Legal Partnership. We're based at the George Washington University. And our goal really is to integrate the healthcare system with uh, the tools they need to be able to bring in those legal services and that expertise to help advance population health. So it's treating uh, your legal professionals, lawyers, paralegals, those legal services teams as specialists um, in an integrated way to address whole person health. Let's go to the next slide. You've heard um, already from our organizations. We just wanna provide a little bit of housekeeping here before we dive right into the content and tell you who we're joined by today as expert, subject matter experts and, pan and panelists to present. Um, so because we are talking about some really sensitive topics here, um, some of which we've experienced or seen and know others have experienced, um, it's uh, really uh, important for us to note that because we are discussing domestic and sexual violence and human trafficking, and they are so prevalent, we assume that there are survivors among us in the audience. So please be aware of your reactions and take care of yourself first. Feel free, turn off the Zoom camera, step away if you need to. We are recording today's webinar and you're welcome to come back to the materials. Uh, the slide deck will also be shared on our website. Also, as you might be posing questions or sharing comments, please be respectful of the patients or clients that you're serving and, and um, ensure that you're guarding uh, and maintaining their confidentiality. All right, now that we've gotten that out of the way, we are allowing for questions and comments to come in to make sure we don't miss them. Please use the Q&A function in Zoom. Um, because we are joining here today to learn more about how to identify strategies to build partnerships generally speaking here, right? Between civil legal services providers and community health centers to better address the health and legal needs of survivors of um, intimate partner violence and exploitation. Secondly, we're hoping that today you'll be better able to describe some strategies for sustaining and growing uh, collaborative health justice responses to preventing and addressing IPV. And um, through not just this webinar, but also an accompanying learning collaborative that we're gonna be launching. And we'll tell you more about that at the end. You'll be able to have uh, at least three tools that can help uh, you as community health centers, civil legal services providers, and for the DV advocacy programs uh, joining us today, really formalize partnerships um, with community-based organizations and develop protocols for responding uh, to domestic violence and uh, build your uh, prevention strategies. Okay. So you've uh, heard from Elena and I already. I wanna go to the slide to introduce you to just very briefly our panelists um, who will be presenting uh, today. Uh, so let's go to the next slide. Um, you'll be first hearing from Dr. Kimberly Chang. She's a family physician and director of the Healthcare and Human Trafficking Policy at Asian Health Services and faculty with health partners on IPV and exploitation and futures without violence. Then you'll hear from Nicole Nelson. She's executive director at Alaska Legal Services Corporation um, about the medical legal partnership programs that she runs. You'll hear from Pat Medage, a senior attorney at Colorado Legal Services about partnerships uh, with the community that she runs to address um, uh, the need, legal needs of survivors uh, of IPV um, or trafficking and exploitation. And you'll also hear from attorney Jessica Brock. She's director of the LAVA Project at Indiana Legal Services 
which has an MLP, but you'll hear about how her work um, is uh, outside of, but also works with the MLP within Indiana Legal Services and other partners in the community. So we have a mixture here for you to hear from today to learn more about how you can develop those strategies, develop tools to really partner, to move further along and advance the work um, that needs to get done to better assist the populations that we share in healthcare, legal services, and TV advocacy programs. With that, I want to pass it on to our colleague, Elena Josue, uh, to begin her presentation. Thanks. Thanks, Bethany. So in the audience today, Bethany mentioned there's folks from civil legal services organizations, from domestic violence advocacy organizations, from community health centers, providers and staff. Um, and through this webinar and the learning collaborative that's to follow, we want to explore with all of you the ways and the opportunities for collaboration that exist between these three really critical community partners. Um, we'll be hearing from advocates um, today and folks who are developing these types of partnerships. Um, we hope, especially in the Learning Collaborative, to create space to hear from all of you more about some of the challenges that you're experiencing in growing, formalizing, sustaining these collaborations and all of the ways in which you found that these types of collaborations have improved outcomes um, for survivors. In the chat, we'll also paste a link in a minute to an article that was written by Dr. Kimberly Chang and my colleague here at Features, Anna Mariavi, along with Hamila Yusasai, about medical legal collaboration and community partnerships to address human trafficking specifically. So encourage you to check it out. There's a lot more information, some models in there, additional case studies that you might find useful as well. So um, like I mentioned, we recognize that there's a number of advocates from different programs in the audience today. And we wanna just take a quick moment to describe and acknowledge the work that you all are doing to support survivors. So as many of you know, domestic violence and sexual assault programs have really vast experience working with survivors of violence and assisting them to identify ways to increase their safety and increase options for safety while assessing risk. And while these programs vary in the services that they offer throughout the country, many programs offer crisis safety planning, housing, and including emergency and transitional housing. Some have legal services or advocacy program connections within their program. Um, Support groups and counseling are common services provided by domestic violence and sexual assault programs, children's services, and employment support, workforce development support. Right now, many DV programs remain open and have remained open during the pandemic, um, some virtually, some in person. Um, so encourage you to reach out to the programs in your community to learn more about, about the services that they offer. Next slide. I'll pass it over to Dr. Chang to talk a little bit more about community health centers. Good morning, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you, Bethany and uh, Elena for um, hosting this. Um, really appreciate uh, your, your work on this and working with you. I wanna emphasize what Elena just talked about, that, 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 um, that, that three um, pillars of, of supporting our patients and our clients who have been trafficked, abused, in situations of exploitation or intimate partner violence. Really the partnerships between community health centers, domestic violence uh, advocacy programs, and the uh, civil, legal, civil legal aid. For us at community health centers, I can't tell you in enough how much these, these two other organizations have helped my patients. For us at community health centers, for those of you who don't know, we are nonprofit, community-driven, community-based, um, healthcare organizations that provide primary care for those who are underserved or uh, um, or marginalized. Um, we often have services that include pharmacy, uh, mental health services, integrated behavioral health services, substance abuse programs, dental services, and we're located in medically underserved areas and for medically underserved populations. Um, it is in our mission that our boards are our, our member, our patients of our of our of our health centers. So we are community directed and community driven. Next slide, please. The other important things about community health centers is that we provide things like enabling services. Enabling services are services that help a patient access our care. I, I can't just sit in my office waiting for someone to show up if they don't have transportation. 
if they don't have um, a proficiency in English, if they don't understand how our medical system works, if they feel like they can't come in to see me because they don't have insurance or they don't know if they're eligible for insurance. So we have people on site that help with health education, health insurance or medical medical eligibility, interpretation and translation, um, uh, outreach services. And these are really important for even um, special populations such as the those who are um, experiencing housing insecurity, people who are working in agricultural um, 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 farm work, and, and, and people who are residents of public housing. Next slide, please. A little bit of background. So I, I, I told you um, that we are private nonprofits. What you don't know is the full scope of this federally supported um, program, health center program. There are nearly 1,400 health center corporations, private nonprofits, all over the country in every single state, territory, and district of Columbia. We operate approximately 14,000 service delivery sites or clinics or, 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 or dental sites or school-based health, pro health programs, serving almost 30 million patients nationwide, most of whom are um, racial or ethnic minorities, in poverty, don't speak English, um, again, agricultural workers, residents of public housing. We provide comprehensive primary care with integrated healthcare services and some of those other programs I mentioned uh, before. So it's really important um, that, that we develop partnerships with our domestic violence advocacy programs, as well as our civil legal service um, partners, because our patients are some of the most um, marginalized uh, community members. They don't have access to many systems of care and protection here in our communities. And so for us uh, serving, being in the service profession, we need to make sure that we are working together so that we can comprehensively support our patients and our clients. Next slide, please. And just to add a little bit more information to what we've been talking about, about why we're here talking about health and the intersection with domestic violence. The National Domestic Violence Hotline recently conducted a survey about the intersections of domestic violence and primary health care. And in that survey, um, they found that about half of those surveys reported a partner controlled or re restricted access to their health care. Almost half of those surveyed, 46%, said that the abuse um, and the frequency and intensity of the abuse had increased during COVID-19. Um, and 42% agreed that their healthcare provider spends time or talks with them without their partner present, which means that healthcare um, locations specifically can be a really critical intervention, an important place for us to be talking about and thinking about um, what folks need related to intimate partner violence. And so for those of you on the call who, who may, who, for, for whom this may be a new issue, what exactly is intimate partner violence? So at Futures Without Violence and in the healthcare field, we look at it more um, in terms of the patient's experiences. We're not looking at it from a criminal justice perspective. So intimate partner violence is when a person in a relationship is using a pattern, a concerted pattern of methods and, ta methods and tactics to gain power and control over the other person. It's often a cycle. It's not just one incident. There's many different kinds of tactics that are used in economic control, uh, physical control and abuse, um, emotional control and abuse, uh, jealousy, um, other, other kinds of tactics, psychological abuse to control uh, the person. And in healthcare, we recognize that for a person who is being abused, leaving an abusive situation, it's not always the safest best or realistic option for survivors. Think about people who are being controlled financially. They don't have a place to stay. They don't have their own uh, uh, bank accounts or money. They don't have a, um, um, they're, they're isolated, socially isolated from the community. And so many times, um, you know, leaving is not always the best option. Next slide, please. And, and in terms of human trafficking, there is a federal criminal definition of human trafficking, and this is what it is. It's, it was signed into law in the year 2000 with the Victims of Trafficking and Violence Protection Act, where 
labor trafficking is defined as the recruitment, harboring, transportation, provision, or obtaining of a person for labor or services through the use of force, fraud, or coercion for purposes of slavery, peonage, debt bondage, or involuntary servitude. And severe forms of sex trafficking is the recruitment, harboring, transportation, provision, or obtaining of a person for a commercial sex act through force, fraud, or coercion, or a commercial sex act in which the person isn't yet 18 years old. So this is a criminal legal definition. Now, having said that, in healthcare, we are not criminal investigators, and I won't be able to, in the course of my 15 minute visit, determine all of the definitions and whether the patient meets these different criteria for a, a, a criminal human trafficking case. So I'd like to move on to what we focus on in healthcare. And, and this is a, a graphic from our, our panelist, Pat Medage here, so she can talk about more, more of it later, but we borrowed this from her and she, she conceived of it, where la labor trafficking is actually a subset of, a pa of patients' experiences from labor exploitation, where labor exploitation, it's not, it's not a legal term, um, it's where an, uh, an employer unfairly benefits from an employee's work. It's not legal or illegal, it's the patient's experiences. In fact, not all forms of labor exploitation are illegal. And then there's the subset of labor violations where this is actually a legal term and, and she can talk more about that later. Um, a legal term where employers are actively violating federal laws or regulations or state laws or municipal laws or regulations, um, particularly for worker treatment, workplace safety, record keeping requirements. And then within that, a smaller subset, there's labor trafficking. And we focus up, up, on the, the broader experience of, experiences of labor exploitation because all of these have health impacts. And again, we are not criminal investigators. And in fact, the ICD-10, the International Classification of Disease Coding that have been introduced for healthcare providers to use, code for ex exploitation and not human trafficking. Next slide, please. Just like uh, labor trafficking, um, sex trafficking is located within a whole spectrum of experiences of sexual violence. Sexual violence is the broader category. It includes rape, sexual assault, uh, child sexual assault, and, and you can see many others here on, on the slide. Within that, there is sexual exploitation, which is the actual or attempt, attempted abuse of a position of power, vulnerability, or trust for sexual purposes. And that can include um, uh, uh, coercive debt exchanges, or uh, we saw for some instances uh, during the pandemic where, where people couldn't make their rent and the landlords were coercing them into sex so that they could be, be cont continue to be housed. Um, and then within that smaller uh, 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 bubble, there is sex trafficking meeting criminal legal definitions. So it's really important for us healthcare looking at the impacts and the health harms and the patient's experiences. Next slide, please. There are intersectional and similar dynamics between human trafficking and intimate partner violence. Those power dynamics of control um, and patterns of abuse and violence. If, if you look at this, this uh, pie chart here on the, the left on your slide, this was a study by a colleague, Dr. McKinney Chisholm Straker um, of homeless youth at Covenant House in New York. And who were these, the, the people who were trafficking these youth? Well, if you look, 36%, that dark blue um, slice there, 36% was their immediate family. So, you know, domestic violence, intimate partner violence, domestic abuse. 27% were boyfriends, 14% were, were friends of their family. Um, uh, the purple, purple, bar, uh, purple pie slice, 14% were employers. So you can see there is a whole um, intersection with intimate partner violence and domestic violence. And, and the dynamics you can see in, in the box, all the, the same dynamics of power and control and the use of drugs and alcohols to control um, uh, the survivor. Next slide, please. These are some of the health impacts for both intimate partner violence and human trafficking. It's not exhaustive. Um, I would I would say that you know any sort of stressful situations and um, trauma can exacerbate chronic medical problems. So they might not even 
um, present in, in acute settings. And so you just have to think about your patients and the context and the experiences that they're, they're, they're going through in their lives. Uh, next slide, please. One of the emphasis um, that Futures Without Violence and Health Partners on Intimate Partner Violence and Exploitation has is a move away in healthcare from screening, screening questions for, for these issues. For example, moving away from directed yes or no questions. For example, Bethany, have, have you been hit, kicked, pushed or shoved in the, in the past year by an uh, intimate partner? Yes or no? We move away from screening because Bethany may have some, some hesitations on sharing the information with me, or I may have hesitations on asking it or time pressures, or I may be asking the question in a way that, that shows her that this is just something I'm doing because it's part of my job and not because I'm really interested. And so, you know, there's barriers to screening. There's barriers for patients, there's barriers for providers uh, to give uh, you know, truthful answer uh, to get truthful answers, um, and there's also risks involved for the patient. And so, Futures Without Violence moves has moved towards a universal education framework and approach. And the universal education approach means that we we provide education about healthy relationships. We offer resources regardless um, of a patient disclosing any abuse or or trauma. So this universal education approach and, and, and Futures has many, many uh, different trainings on this, very comprehensive. They've done so much research proving that it works. Um, this universal education approach gives us in healthcare an opportunity to reach patients who have never experienced intimate partner violence or human trafficking, but may be at risk. Those who are currently experiencing intimate partner violence and human trafficking and those who may have a lifetime history or a past history of it. And it also gives them a, a way to empower our patients with education and resources so that when they do feel like it is an appropriate time for them to leave an abusive situation, they have the means and the power and the resources and the people who they can trust and reach out to from our domestic violence advocacy partners and our civil legal partners. Next slide, please. Choose. This is the intervention um, that Futures has developed. It stands for confidentiality, the universal education approach, empowerment, um, where you're helping the patient um, be able to uh, um, um, reach in, reach, reach in and, and help uh, their community members as well as themselves, and then the support. These are safety cards that they have developed. Um, this is not a training today, um, but I really encourage you to go to the Health Partners on IPV and Exploitation website to find out uh, where you can get these cards from Futures Without Violence and get more of this um, information and training on it. Um, so that's the framework that we use and that's what we're hoping um, you can take, some of what you can take away as a tool to help your clients and your patients. Next slide, please. Uh, thanks, Dr. Ching. So like Dr. Ching mentioned on our website, you can find a lot more information about cues. I also would just put a plug in for the learning collaborative that we'll be talking about later on in the webinar today, where we're going to go into a lot more detail about cues and the cues approach and about partnering with domestic violence advocacy programs and other community-based organizations um, to develop protocols, Memorandums of Understanding. There's samples of both on the website that's listed on the slide, ipvhealthpartners.org, including an online toolkit that was developed in partnership with health centers and domestic violence programs um, that, you know, perhaps give spark some ideas or help um, guide the programs out there who are looking to develop these types of partnerships in their community. So I encourage you all to take some time to go onto that website and explore a little bit. And then we'll be talking about it more in the learning collaborative that we have coming up. So just to share, we've, we've spoken about domestic violence advocacy programs. We've spoken about community health centers. We wanna shift a little bit to legal services supports and um, legal services partners and the services that they offer for survivors. Um, we know that survivors of domestic violence and human trafficking also, in addition to their healthcare needs, 
may have legal services needs, and that legal services providers, such as the three programs that you're going to hear for in a minute today, are reaching survivors with those services that they, that they provide. Um, the types of legal services programs um, that are out there that support survivors might include programs that offer assistance related to housing, such as eviction defense, or support on other housing protections, such as protecting public housing, um, access, things like that, family law, including child custody, separation and divorce assistance, or child and spousal support assistance. Many legal services pro programs also offer orders of protection, support, um, or immigration-related legal assistance for survivors. Um, some also include support for on issues related to economic security and public benefits or criminal record expungement. Um, so in the same vein of reaching out to your domestic violence advocacy program and asking about the types of services that they provide, you could do the same for your local legal services organization as well to learn more about the types of, of resources and support and legal services that are provided within their organization. Next slide. And I'll turn it over to Bethany. Thanks, Elena. And thank you, Dr. Chang. So um, before you hear from the legal partners, um, I do want to just make sure everyone receives just some level setting information on the medical legal partnerships. But I do want to emphasize and stress for those of you who are partnering outside of that specific approach and structure, that those partnerships are just as valuable. I want to continue to um, encourage you to uh, uh, work outside of um, your individual silos and just partner. That's the point of today's presentation. So MLP is one approach. It is an intervention where you are bringing together the legal partners and the healthcare partners to really collaborate to address those social needs, those social determinants of health, the ones that are health harming legal needs and have a remedy in civil law. And for MLPs, they have some core activities. They engage in activities that are the traditional direct legal assistance, like what Elena just talked about. They also engage in trainings for healthcare providers and teams to, as to ensure that those uh, doctors, nurses, CHWs, those social workers in the healthcare settings can actually better screen for and understand what might be a health harming legal need. They also engage in those clinical level changes so they can do some preventative legal advocacy work and also go upstream to the policy level changes that create systemic change for entire communities um, so that you don't have that revolving door in the healthcare, in the legal setting, in the DV advocacy program settings um, anymore. So, um, Elena, I just want to go back to what Elena mentioned about civil legal services and note that for the health center advocacy programs, uh, many of us are all addressing the needs of the exact same people and populations, the same families, uh, many of whom are low income, um, are survivors of domestic violence, um, exploitation and trafficking. Um, however, for the civil legal services folks in particular, I think it's important to know that that community, um, are, they're largely funded by LSC and the Legal Services Corporation or LSC provides data and reports on um, how great the access to justice problem is. In other words, how many people need legal services and are able to receive those legal services because of the lack of funding um, or the scarcity of lawyers, just like we see in terms of the shortage of providers in the healthcare field. So for low-income survivors of domestic violence, when they seek professional legal help, only 23% of them are actually seeking or receiving um, legal services. Imagine how much healthcare and DV advocacy programs can help to increase access to justice if we recognize that people understand when, they, when something hurts, they understand when they've experienced an incident of violence or exploitation, but they may not at all understand that to be a legal issue that a lawyer can help with. The open door that you provide as a healthcare provider, as a DV advocacy program is an open door that folks um, often walk through because of medical legal partnerships 
to uh, getting their legal needs met. So I just wanted to note that um, because I think Dr. Chang had mentioned uh, and Elaine had mentioned this um, uh, no, no wrong door like approach that um, healthcare can provide to uh, many of our CBOs uh, in the community to address legal needs. So speaking of the various partners, let's go to the next slide. I just wanna note that for medical legal partnerships, um, I defined it as healthcare and legal partners coming together but in forming these legal partnerships, especially, especially addressing the needs of IPV, DV, and trafficking and expo exploitation um, victims and survivors, it's really important to remember how many different um, organizations or partners or professionals really address those various needs. It's very important that we've seen, um, uh, for example, at HealthLink in Indiana, that MLP, and you'll hear from the LAVA project today, but that MLP has engaged with a health center that um, is able to form a relationship and build a rapport with law enforcement. We are seeing medical legal partnerships and non-medical legal partnerships um, work with the court to be able to better address the needs of and prevent um, human trafficking. We've also seen um, health plans and payers, state Medicaid agencies, foundations really get involved. And so I wanna encourage folks to look broader into um, who's involved in the community and what are the needs of um, survivors, such as, for example, transportation barriers. Why not work with transportation officials? We know that airports have really worked aggressively to train uh, their professionals to look out for trafficking victims. So why not also partner with your transportation officials to see what you can do to be right there at the ready, at the hotlines to um, be able to address the needs as they're identified in public transportation and transit systems. All right, so you, let's say you formed a medical legal partnership. This next slide really is for the legal partners out there because I know um, it's particularly challenging um, to talk about legal problems and then the intervention and then um, ad really address like how that has made a health impact. So back in 2015 and 2016, not just the National Center, but really medical legal partnership practitioners out there in the field did some work to develop a framework for the attorneys working on these issues to be able to say, for example, for a domestic abuse case, something that might be coded for legal services corporation uh, funded legal organizations. How do we show what health impact our legal intervention had. So when you're thinking about, for example, the financial abuse, um, the uh, systemic um, uh, barriers that a, a domestic violence victim faces when it comes to being independent or being able to obtain, get to court to obtain a protective order, um, begin to think about once you've been able to help that individual obtain or renew a protective order, secure a child custody order, um, or um, Perhaps you're addressing the housing problem um, by assisting them with their divorce proceedings so that they can move out of that, uh, that shelter that they feel like they're stuck in. That's where you're helping that person really enhance their financial ability to access care, enhance their financial ability to purchase healthy foods, um, reduce the risk of injury because you remove them from that situation through the protective order. You've improved their ability to make health positive decisions you've increased access or continuity um, of care. Um, so those are some of the ways I would like to just, um, for the legal audience that's tuned in, help you understand how, looks like my camera fell. That was a hardware issue, <laughs> user problem, apologies. Um, but those are some of the ways that the legal community can, um, you know, talk more about how your legal intervention uh, whether it's through general partnerships or medical legal partnerships have really um, uh, created a health impact, not just a medical impact, but a health impact. Um, and that's the value of your partnership. With that, I wanna transition first to our first panelist, Orlena will be introducing our panelists, but you'll note that you'll hear from the first panelist to talk about MLP, but our other two panelists will talk about broader partnerships. And let us know if you have questions, we're paying attention to the Q&A in the chat. Thanks, everyone. Uh, thanks, Bethany. So I wanna just transition us to our amazing panel who I think are exploring so many of the issues that we talked about in the first part of this webinar and who are innovating and who um, have been doing this work for, for many years. So we're really, uh, excited and grateful to each of them for coming and participating on our webinar. So our first panelist 
um, is Nicole Nelson, who's the Executive Director at Alaska Legal Services. And Nicole, I'll pass it to you to speak a little bit about the medical legal partnership model that you all have developed and some of the experiences that, that you all are seeing up, up where you're at. Thank you. Thank you so much. So I'm Nicole Nelson. And as Elena said, I'm the executive director of Alaska Legal Services. And I have been um, working at Alaska Legal Services for 25 years uh, since graduating law school and um, have lived um, in Anchorage, which is also the traditional and contemporary homelands of the Dena'ina people. Um, and I want to tell you a little bit today about how our community came together to build a network of a statewide network of medical legal partnerships that continues to evolve. And the process that we went through to um, sort of get that lifted and, and, move, and move forward. Um, but to understand that we took a very um, community-based approach to doing so. And so I need to, I feel like I need to explain a little bit about the context in which we operate, the challenges that we face, um, in our communities and also the opportunities that those provided. And then I'll also give an overview of sort of where we are and where we hope to be in the future. Um, so the first slide, a little bit about the place that um, we, our landscape that we operate in. So for those of you who don't know, Alaska is I think a beautiful place that's full of mountains and glaciers and sea. Next slide, um, it's magic. Um, in the winter, we have northern lights, um, and it's a, it's a land that has huge weather extremes, so it can range from negative 40 in some parts of the state until, um, you know, uh, up to 100 degrees in the summertime in the interior. And we have a huge um, service area. Our state is, um, if you look at this map, is um, if you overlay Alaska over the continental United States, it would span from coast to coast, and it is bigger than the uh, next three biggest states combined, which is California, Montana, and Texas. Um, but we have also very low population density. So there are only about 750,000 of us, and um, we are spread across um, both next slide. We uh, live. This is a picture of Anchorage, which is uh, where most of the population lives. About half of us live in cities like Anchorage, um, which is nestled in the mountains and in the sea. And um, next slide. And then many of us also live in smaller villages that can range from 30 people to several hundred um, to hub communities, um, which may have up to 10,000. Um, next slide. Many of our uh, most remote communities are only accessible by flying in, they're not road connected, or snow machine or by water um, during the, the summer months. Next slide. We are also fortunate to be the most indigenous state in the union. We are home to 229 tribes. Um, next slide. And we are privileged to have, um, you know, uh, the opportunity to um, have um, a very indigenous culture within our uh, across our states. As I noted before, many of our communities are very small and they're scattered across this vast expanse. 90% of our communities are off the road system. They're not road connected. And so if you look here um, where the white line is on your screen, that's where the road system is. Um, and that also, um, so those are the only road connected communities, but you can see all the little other dots are, are communities that um, are not road connected. So next slide. A little bit about our organization, Alaska Legal Services has been um, serving our community since we opened our doors in 1967. Um, we are Alaska's only legal aid a comprehensive legal aid organization. And we have been allied with our tribal community since we opened our doors in 1967. Um, next slide. One of the challenges our communities face um, across the state and, um, is uh, we have some of the highest rates of domestic violence and sexual assault um, in the nation. And so there have been several reports that have found that our um, you know, that uh, domestic violence and sexual assault disproportionately impacts our state at rates that are um, much higher than the rest of the nation, and that this disproportionately impacts our Alaska Native uh, sisters and Indigenous um, community. 
and also that we do not have a lot of the infrastructure that folks would come to expect um, of in the rest of the lower 48. And so that provides um, a, a significant number of challenges um, when we are trying to address uh, domestic violence and sexual assault. Okay, next slide. So one of the things about Alaska Legal Services that we're quite proud of is that despite the fact that we, um, uh, you know, we're, we are able to serve about 7,500 Alaskans per year. And even though um, we have 12 offices throughout the state, um, as I mentioned before, all of the, the communities, um, the outlying communities, we do a pretty good job of getting out there too. And in the last year, we served 100, we served folks in 197 different communities, most of which are off the road system. Um, but try as we might, next slide, we just like every other legal aid provider I know of, we have to turn away one person for everyone that we accept because we don't have the resources to provide the services um, that are asked of us. And that's not even addressing those folks who aren't able to reach us to apply for services. So we know that the justice gap is huge and it's heartbreaking. And so our community in 2017 came together, the legal community came together to try to address the justice gap and to come up with a plan to figure out how we would move forward. And as part of, um, our, our, as part of our planning, next slide, our justice gap planning, we wanted to map out what resources we had within our community. And the first thing we started with were the legal resources. We realized, and if you'll look at um, this map, that the lawyers, and this is really no surprise, will come as no surprise to most of you, um, all, the lawyers were all concentrated in the areas along the road system where the biggest population centers are. So that's Anchorage and Fairbanks. Um, and then there were a few um, legal providers in sort of the outlying hub communities, mostly Alaska Legal Services um, and public defenders or government attorneys. But there really were most of those other communities had no connection um, to legal help should they need it. Next slide. Our community then looked at what resources those other communities had. Um, and we found that when we did a, sort of a, an assessment of our communities, that our medical providers, our community health centers had the, had the biggest footprint across our state. They had the strongest infrastructure. Um, and there was a community health aid, um, a community health clinic within almost every community within Alaska. So our legal community immediately thought we would like to really work. How can we borrow some of this really robust infrastructure that has been built out by our, our medical community? And so we did a little bit of thinking and we talked with the Center for, Med for Medical Legal Partnership. Next, next slide. And we realized um, in talking with folks from um, the healthcare side of the field that they may want to partner with us and share their infrastructure because as it turns out, um, we learned that um, a person's health care is um, a person's health is determined 20% um, by the health care they they um, receive, about 20% from genetics, and then 60% from the social, environmental, and behavioral factors, which are often referred to as social determinants of health. This, these were new words to us. And as it turned out, um, next slide. The social determinants of health really overlaid. Um, almost precisely with the needs that legal aid um, were providing, where we're trying to address, that we're trying to, uh, to address their housing, their lack of job, lack of food support, special education services, domestic violence. The same um, legal problems that, that legal aid practitioners are trying to address really have a vast overlay with the social determinants of health. And so we learned that we should start talking about these as health um, harming legal needs. Next slide. So we came together, um, we held a convening in 2017 um, with the National Center for Medical Legal Partnership joined us to help us um, have a conversation with our, our healthcare community to, um, to talk with our healthcare community to see if they would, wanted to partner and move forward. And our, the Alaska Native Tribal Health Consortium immediately stepped in and said, yes, this makes a lot of sense to us and we want to move forward with a partnership. And part of that partnership we originally, which was interesting, thought that we would just as legal providers want to um, borrow the infrastructure of our healthcare partners. But in the process, we developed a true partnership in which we learned so much about how um, 
our healthcare partners were so far ahead of us in thinking about how they were delivering community-based services that we um, really changed the way our model of um, delivering legal aid. So the first step we did is we started embedding um, attorneys within um, a network of healthcare um, providers. So in the tribally operated healthcare centers, we have six of those. But we also learned from our healthcare partners that for a very long time, um, for more than 20 years, they had, uh, uh, um, had developed um, a sort of stratified healthcare practitioners that were community-based and culturally appropriate. And we're building a workforce to support the community health aides that were from the communities that they were serving and that they were um, developing skills within those communities to screen, surface, and triage healthcare needs and try to address them um, with support as needed from other um, healthcare practitioners. And we thought, well, we would like to do this too. We would like to replicate that same model um, in the legal aid world. Well, in going through that process, we learned that you know some communities maybe have are small, so they have maybe 30, 40 people. So there might not be enough room for, or there may not be enough um, people available to be both sort of a community justice worker and a community health aide. And so we thought that um, we could maybe piggyback the training that we provided um, to community health days, provide them some legal empowerment training that would help them understand the health harming legal needs, um, provide education about what remedies those are and help um, people um, address the unmet legal needs that people were experiencing to the extent that they could. And if the matter was more serious, they could then refer it to um, an advanced legal practitioner who could, uh, like an attorney, um, who could then um, resolve the problem. So next step, next slide. Um, our pro um, so again, our medical legal partnership is really looking to build communi a community-based justice and health workforce. Next slide. And I'll end it there by saying that um, this is a work in progress. Again, we started in 2017, but over the course of the pandemic, when we thought we would, um, we were experiencing our most challenging um, days, we thought that our medical legal partnerships would, you know, may not, um, that we may have to rethink our model. But it turned out during this time, we were able to recruit and train over 200 um, lay advocates who are community-based, um, community-based justice workers who have gone through our screening modules um, and are also um, providing services to um, the folks who need it in rural and remote communities. And they're supported by um, our, uh, our more official legal aid partnerships with attorneys embedded in the healthcare centers. So I'll turn it over. Thank you. Thank you so much, Nicole. Um, I feel a little bit like a commercial for our learning collaborative that is coming up later in the month, but I'm, I'm going to go with it and just say, um, you know, Nicole, the work that you all are doing in, in Alaska is, is so innovative and inspiring and just encourage folks to sign up for our learning collaborative later on this month where you'll have an opportunity to hear more from Nicole and, um, and, and think collaboratively about the ways in which challenges specific challenges that are specific to your communities might also um, or could be addressed through similar types of thinking around collaboration and innovation and, um, and, and learning from our partners in the community. So thank you so much, Nicole. And I'm going to now turn it over to our second panelist, Pat Medage, who's going to, um, who's from Colorado Legal Services and who's going to speak a little bit more about growing informal partnerships with healthcare providers and civil legal services. And, and how to support the formal medical legal partnerships that might also exist in your organization. Um, take it away. Okay, great. Um, just wave at me if I'm too quiet. Um, and also, um, please uh, put me in the line uh, for Nicole's workshop. Um, I think I could learn a lot. Um, thank you, Nicole, that was um, so informative. Uh, we definitely don't have a big uh, statewide um, program, uh, but I can tell you a little bit about um, what's been effective here or what we've been able to do here. So first of all, we also are a statewide legal services organization um, funded by, um, I think Dr. Cheng mentioned earlier, Legal Services Corporation, um, so federally funded. 
Uh, we have offices around the state and in our Denver office, we have several uh, units that do what you would consider traditional legal work, um, benefits issues, uh, family law, um, landlord tenant and other housing issues and so forth. Um, around the state, um, we have 13 offices uh, that do um, don't have units as much as sort of the staff who are, provide, are, they're more generalists providing uh, a whole range of, of civil legal services. So I head up our survivor services unit. We are statewide and we're based in Denver. In that uh, unit, we do a lot of the immigration related work, um, including the special, what they call humanitarian vis visas for victims of various crimes, uh, and then T visas for victims of human trafficking who also could qualify for uh, U visas. Um, we also serve US survivors of trafficking and other civil legal needs such as sealing records that was mentioned earlier. Uh, we have a couple of, uh, or we have a history of formal medical legal partnerships uh, that I've not been directly involved in. I will talk about them a little bit as far as how uh, my unit has supported um, those programs. So next slide, please. So I'll start with an example uh, case uh, uh, based on an actual case. Um, it, I did not put a lot of detail in the PowerPoint because it's a fairly sensitive issue. Um, it crosses into IPV and human trafficking. And this was not the reason I chose this case example, but actually the perpetrator was a doctor, uh, which I did not put in the PowerPoint. So it was unintentional, but I have perhaps uh, a good reason to include it. So this, uh, a man pursued a woman in another country through social media. They started seeing each other. Um, he would visit her country. Um, they had a good time together. He uh, was in a marriage with children, said he um, it was you know, an unhappy relationship. He was going to get divorced, persuaded her to uh, and helped support her to come to the US to Denver and to study. So helped her uh, with the support needed to get the student visa, which is an F visa. Um, the relationship, he, he quote, set her up in an apartment, um, became very demanding, very controlling, um, abusive um, within a whole, a whole lot of different ways. Um, but she was able to attend school, but as it became more and more controlling, um, she was having trouble in, in school, obviously huge amounts of trauma, um, things she couldn't tell her family back home. Um, and so she sought counseling on campus um, through, through campus counseling. Uh, they identified actually potential trafficking and, and referred her to CLS. Um, I think what's important is they set up a, a quote warm call. So we had a joint call together rather than just giving out a bunch of phone numbers. Um, the client um, had, she, she, there were various issues, first of all, housing issues, because when she started standing up to this person, uh, he stopped paying the rent, so she had an issue with her landlord um, and was in, in, in a crunch, you know, in the middle of the semester. I should say this um, came to light in April 2020, so when everybody was in lockdown, so she was super isolated, um, very stressed. Uh, her only communication with everybody was, you know, Zoom or phone. Um, so all to say it's possible it was possible to provide representation and make the connections even during sort of the height of quarantine. Um, the, we did the immigration work, which I'll talk more, more about, and then various in, informal support. So in terms of the immigration work, um, there certainly was sex assault and IPV, um, but we identified, and, and the psychologist um, identified that she was having to provide sexual services in order to um, keep her apartment, to keep her F visa, to um, be able to attend school. Um, and the definition in the, in the definition of human traf uh, sex trafficking that Dr. Cheng uh, reviewed, um, commercial sex is sex in exchange for money or a thing of value. So this was actually sex trafficking because he was paying her rent and she had to engage in this behavior 
uh, in order to um, maintain um, the housing and so forth. So when we think of sex trafficking, we often think of a pimping situation or a brothel situation, and it can be just a one-on-one -on -one situation that constitutes commercial sex. Um, so from there, she was um, referred also to on-campus services. We're very fortunate. There's a downtown campus that houses three public um, colleges and universities and that actually has a center that um, provides support for um, individuals who exp have experienced IPV. So they provide it. They don't have ongoing services, but they provide, they refer people to different resources. So she connected to that. Uh, so we were able to do a T visa. The original psychologist who identified this um, provided a very crucial letter. I won't go into details, um, but a letter from a mental health professional was very important. Uh, the informal support was because um, because of her financial issues and also because of the trauma of the situation, her grades had suffered. So we had helped provide letters explaining the situation so that she could um, basically stay on probation on campus and, and so forth, and, and also trying to find other assistance. So not strictly legal work, but it's just something that's necessary. Um, and ultimately, um, actually just about a month ago, she did receive her T visa, which is for victims of trafficking. It's huge because she now qualifies for federal financial aid. She um, has improved her grades. She's been able to focus on college um, for trafficking victims. Um, they can tap into basically the same benefits that a refugee or asylee gets. So it's very important to um, identify trafficking when possible because uh, with at least in Colorado and in most states, there aren't, the benefits are not as good with the other types of humanitarian visas such as U visas. Um, so that's a, 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 an intersection of um, domestic violence advocates and uh, health professional and then legal services sort of working together. Next slide, please. So informal uh, MLPs, um, that's what I, I personally am most part of. Um, we have a lot of relationships. As I said, our unit covers the state. Um, so we need to have contacts all around the state with uh, main domestic violence organizations, immigrant rights organizations, and certainly the medical community. We had funding for about 15 years uh, through Health and Human Services to, pro to provide outreach um, related to human trafficking. And one of our grant partners um, had a, a targeted um, training focusing on medical communities. So they did trainings um, all over the state and we often participated in those and also um, were able to, you know, be nimble and switch to Zoom when the pandemic hit. So that, that focuses, as Dr. Chang uh, mentioned on, in, you know, sort of, observing uh, red flags when interacting with patients. Um, we help provide, connect providers to, to the, the federal, also through Health and Human Services, the SOAR program, which Dr. Chang is certainly a part of and might want to say more about that. Um, but we provide uh, trainings at every chance we can to victim services networks or particular staff, um, trying to be opportunistic, not in a bad way, but um, in a productive way, as far as whenever we have contact we, with an organization, we provide education. So if a client is at a shelter, we'll take, take some time to chat with them about what we do, provide our flyers. Um, in a very sad situation, a client, um, a, a trafficking survivor client um, harmed herself, ended up in the hospital um, and Oddly enough, asked them to call me <clears throat> to call me. So social workers at the hospital called me. I provided them the same type of you know information I just mentioned, and they and their successors are still calling me, which is uh, very important and um, very 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 necessary. Um, so really, just having those connections, being responsive, and so forth. Um, so my advice um, in setting these up and on the legal provider side is being flexible because <clears throat> a lot of the calls I get don't relate to trafficking or IPV. 
um, very sadly, they're often, um, Clinton, especially the community clinics, um, dealing with individuals, you know, who are seriously ill, perhaps terminally ill, uh, without legal status, don't have any health care benefits, and they're just asking us to screen and, and try to identify any possible way they might be able to attain status. So it's, it's very difficult. You know, we're not going to respond with, oh, we don't do that. You know, we need to be flexible and try to be responsive, um, even if it's not within our scope of services. With our formal, um, the formal MLP we have right now, um, they, um, yeah, and actually, if you would go to the previous slide just for a second more, the previous, the, the, in, the formal one um, is very, is, it's, it's called Tele, Tele Legal Partnership, Tele Medical Legal Partnership. And it intentionally was set up as being uh, more remote with the idea of expanding it into rural areas. And the, in speaking with the, the person heading that up right now, um, she kind of uh, missed the fact that we were in local um, clinics, you know, with a regular presence um, because healthcare providers are so trusted. And that is where, you know, people are going to the community health clinic more than they're going to legal aid, you know, and, and legal aid can be challenging even to get into the door. So um, I have this, what I think is an important point, where is the trust? Sometimes the trust is with the legal provider, such as my client asking for me to be called when she was in the hospital. Um, but very often the community health center is the, um, is, is the place where pe people are, are most comfortable and having legal folks there at, with some regularity can be a positive um, when it's possible. Of course, in, in broad, it, it, far spread uh, areas such as Alaska or rural Colorado, that's not possible. And the tele model is, is important, but um, um, it's just, I think all of us can kind of look at when we're doing the assessments that were spoken about earlier, setting up a program, assessing uh, the needs, it, certainly one focus should be where, where, where is the trust, as I said. Next slide now, please. So the, the current model, as I said, is a tele um, medical legal partnership um, where in the network um, there's at the healthcare providers pro provide an eight question survey determinants of health issues which might have been what was mentioned in the chat. Um, Dr. Cheng, I'm not sure if it's the universal education approach but um, there are not legal questions but these general questions and then in the system it automatically um, sends an alert to our legal staff um, that there has been this screening uh, or this initial you know possible identification of legal issues and then they follow up from that so there's not a lot of back and forth with phone calls and so forth they just log into the the portal uh, and see what's what's needed uh, the previous model was what I would consider oh sorry and there are is issues not surprisingly right now are a lot of housing issues especially due to covid um, people behind on rent, people facing eviction, uh, also some benefits and food stamps issues, and some consumers such as credit card debt also related to COVID and or again being behind on rent and so forth. Um, in comparison, the previous model was what I would consider more traditional. There were office hours at Children's Hospital, um, funded by Children's Hospital, um, and they um, would do the guardian, some guardianships, powers of attorney, and those sorts of issues um, that to, that might a lot of people might think are more sort of more traditional uh, medical legal partnership issues. Um, but we supported the, that program um, by providing trainings, um, for example, on the types of um, documents or letters that immigration providers ask from uh, medical staff. So there are different types, many different types of immigration applications. All of them have different requirements. Sometimes it might be related to hardship to a child who may have had a medical issue. Sometimes it might be the emotional or physical abuse experienced by the victim. And so um, providing that training about um, what, why we are always requesting letters from healthcare providers and sort of 
why it's important and uh, a little bit of detail about um, the different types of letters without getting into too much depth. Uh, at the same time, um, we learn from healthcare providers. So certainly working with the type of work I do, um, trainings on the effects of trauma, on the medical effects and psychological effects of trauma is very important. And then sometimes um, trainings on special needs of certain populations. Um, and so it can be a two-way street where we can help with legal trainings and healthcare providers can help us be more informed uh, in, in our services since we're lawyers and may not be sensitive to various issues, including trauma issues. Uh, I repeated flexibility because I think that's really key, but I won't talk more about it. In terms of funding these, um, there has been for various um, foundation funding behind a lot of this, um, particularly um, healthcare or health access foundations, not as much in, certain ter in terms of sort of traditional legal funding, um, but I, I would definitely emphasize that as a, a way, to, uh, something to explore to get started. Next slide, please. So other models, um, actually a pharmaceutical company actually funded a law school fellowship or a law graduate fellowship um, for a partner organization. I'm, on the, I'm a founding member of another, this organization, the Rocky Mountain Immigrant Advocacy Network. And out at the Immigration Detention Center, they had a fellow working on um, with the medical legal partnership because of the, the needs of the detained in, individuals particularly since Denver was chosen as a hub for trans uh, women um, from all over the country being housed at immigration detention, uh, the Immigration Detention Center. So this medical legal partnership helped to address, address their particular medical needs, um, including during COVID when um, being part of a lawsuit to get their release because they were medically uh, vulnerable. Uh, there is one regional clinic that, with, with various offices that has legal staff actually on, on board, um, to some extent volunteer, um, but not completely. Um, and then, as I said, just various, just having various trainings for the, you know, human services networks, nursing associations, uh, of course, victim services networks. Next slide, please. And I will leave it at that. Um, thank you. It's nice to be here. Thank, thank you so much, Pat. I, your your presentation makes me just reflect on the ways in which you know the deep expertise of a particular unit or team can also be a launching point to developing relationships, both with formal MLPs, with healthcare providers, and so it's it's, it's just a reflection on using our strengths. And, and thinking about what our strengths are as a way to sort of launch relationships that can support many survivors. So really appreciate those reflections. Um, and now I will pass it on to Jessica Brock from um, the LAVA project at Indiana Legal Services. Thanks, Elena. And thanks to all of the previous presenters. Um, I feel honored to be in such experienced and great company. Um, so as was said, I direct what's called the LAVA Project at Indiana Legal Services. Um, LAVA stands for Legal Assistance for Victimized Adults. And we have been around since October of 2016. We are, Indiana Legal Services is a legal services corporation funded um, statewide organization like Alaska Legal Services and Colorado Legal Services with offices around the state of Indiana. And our project is funded by uh, VOCA funding, which is Victims of Crime Act funding. And I suspect that many of you here also receive uh, VOCA funds for various things, but our project is entirely uh, funded by VOCA funding. So um, we have a, a different funding source and therefore different limitations than um, our coworkers who are legal services corporation funded, but um, in terms of services clients receive, there's, there's not much difference. Uh, next slide, please. So we are, um, like I said, a special project within Indiana Legal Services. And our uh, because we are 
Victims of Crime Act funded, we only serve victims of crime. So uh, our mission is to provide free high quality legal services to older adults, which in the state of Indiana means someone age 60 or older, or endangered adults, which is what we call folks who are eligible for the services of adult protective services in our state. Um, generally speaking, that's an adult with some sort of um, disability who have experienced criminal behavior. Um, most often that's in the form of abuse, neglect, or financial exploitation. And our um, hope is to stop the violence and then to ease and eliminate the effects of the violence that the client has endured. Um, we have, in addition to attorneys on our staff, we also have a social worker and so part of our mission is also to provide non-legal social support services for clients so that their legal victories are more um, meaningful in their lives. And then like others, we also provide legal education in the community to uh, fellow professionals like all of you and to the general public um, to make folks more aware of our services and to help um, people identify uh, individuals who may have experienced um, abuse, neglect, or exploitation. Next slide, please. So as I said, um, we serve people who um, are crime victims. Um, we define this as broadly as possible to help as many people as possible. So this means that the crime doesn't have to be formally charged by a prosecutor in the criminal justice system. Um, it need not even be reported to police. We have many people, especially in the case of family violence, who don't want to report um, abuse done ordinarily by children or grandchildren to authorities because they don't want their family member to go to jail or to lose their job, but they do want the violence to stop and to get relief. Um, so, so long as there's something criminal in the fact pattern, we are able to help those folks. Uh, and then in addition to experiencing a crime, they have to be an older adult or um, an endangered adult. We, um, this is for my fellow lawyers in, uh, here, but we've made the decision to only represent folks who have the legal, the capacity to retain us as their legal counsel. Um, our professional rules allow us to represent folks who, um, don't have the capacity to retain legal counsel under one of our professional rules or to represent folks through a guardian or another agent like an attorney in fact, but we choose not to do that. Oftentimes because those are the exact people who are doing the abuse, but um, also because our goal is to provide the client with um, autonomy and the ability to reclaim their story and their life. And so we don't want a third party involved in that process. So we've made that other um, decision as a program that the, the client has to be able to retain us, him or herself. Um, next slide, please. So what do we do? Um, we do anything any other law firm anywhere can do, except um, you know we don't do criminal defense, but we give people, some people just want advice about what are their options? Do I have a legal issue? If so, what can I do? what would be the pros and cons of pursuing different courses of action. So we sometimes just um, offer advice. That's what people want so they can make an informed decision about their situation. Um, we also, of course, take people to court, sue, um, and everything in between negotiating, um, mediating. And then with our social worker, we also um, help identify social resources for folks. Uh, like transportation, like Dr. Chang was mentioning, you know, we can't um, purport to offer services if they're inaccessible to folks. So we try to um, provide transportation, translation. We have, have, we've had several clients who are nonverbal and we've had to um, find the resources so that they could communicate their, their needs and wishes, not only to us, but to the legal system. Um, Providing referrals oftentimes to mental health professionals, that's a major need in our client uh, population is for mental health support. Um, we help them understand the legal process. You know, the social worker in our group, she speaks lawyer, but she also speaks non-lawyer. So she's a helpful translator 
um, to clients in, in terms of explaining what's really happening and empathizing with clients um, in terms of what it's like to experience the legal system that um, myself as an attorney, I'm so familiar with that I, I can sometimes forget how um, scary that can be to engage in. And she also uh, helps us with developing community relationships and um, conducting outreach presentations. Um, so next slide. Sometimes I find it helpful to give some concrete examples of the cases we take. Um, so oftentimes we assume people know what we mean, but we've found again and again that they, they, <laughs> they don't know what we mean. Um, so like I said, we have guardians and, and folks operating under a power of attorney who are often uh, financially exploiting and also physically abusing uh, the, the clients. So we will, in the case of a guardianship or, or maybe called a conservatorship in your place, um, we will terminate those when they're not uh, needed or we'll seek to modify them so that they're more limited if someone doesn't need support in all areas of their life. Uh, we also help clients draft supported decision-making agreements if that's more appropriate to meet their needs. Um, and then we sue guardians for um, assets taken. We've, with client permission, tried to get them prosecuted for abuse of um, an endangered adult and conversion of property. Um, we revoke the powers of attorney and help them write new ones if that's what they want, if they wanna name someone else as their power of attorney. Um, in the state of Indiana, an attorney in fact is required to provide a written accounting for all of their services upon request. So we'll ask for those and then sue when they don't do it. Um, we do anything related to the crime. So for example, sometimes theft occurs with a transfer of a house, a forged quit claim deed, or um, a trustee behaving inappropriately in a trust. So we'll get involved in those cases to hold folks accountable or revoke transfer of property. Um, you know, we deal with domestic violence. So we get orders of protection, maybe called restraining orders in your place um, to separate folks from their abusers. Um, and we, in the state of Indiana, one of the the things you can ask for in those cases is if you're living with the abuser, we have what's called a kickout order. We can, the court can grant or order that the, the abuser is kicked out of the residence, regardless of who actually owns the place. So um, we use that frequently to create space and provide safety for our clients to separate them from the abuser when they're living together. Um, it's, and it's of course much quicker than the formal eviction process. So it provides safety um, to our clients. We have a lot of unwanted house guests, um, namely people who say they're going to stay for a day or keep their stuff in the basement for a while. And then three months later, they're still in the house, verbally abusing the client, eating all of their food, living off of their social security um, checks. Um, so we send very um, choicely worded letters to them and reminding them that they're trespassing and asking them to leave and if that doesn't work, then we uh, pursue eviction actions or orders of protection if, if that is appropriate. Um, we file a lot of financial exploitation cases. We have a great senior consumer protection law in Indiana that um, offers that you can get what we call treble damages. So if someone steals $500 from an older adult, we can get three times that as the award. So we can ask for $1,500. And um, you know, you imagine like a roofing scam that's maybe worth 10 grand. Now you're looking at a $30,000 judgment against this, this person. It's a great um, tool that we can offer our clients. Um, and then we deal with what folks might think of when, when they think of um, crime or scams, uh, you know, like the people in Jamaica or wherever else asking for money via um, MoneyGram or Western Union or um, Green Dot cards, or all of that kind of stuff we deal with, um, romance scams, that kind of thing. Um, next slide, please. Um, we do have, we were fortunate to have it, it was one of um, actually my first clients referred to us um, 
uh, you can actually go to the next slide, thanks, by Adult Protective Services. Um, and we have a video. She, she decided to share her story publicly because she, quote, didn't want what happened to her to happen to anyone else. And so um, I think we're going to share that story, the link to that story in the chat or afterwards. And, and I invite you to watch Kim's story because she's a, she um, experienced a horrific um, event and she was a, a powerful storyteller. But um, our project was actually started because of community partners. Um, in the state of Indiana, like I'm sure many other states, Adult Protective Services is incredibly underfunded and um, their clients really needed a concrete resource. You know, what the um, investigators for Adult Protective Services were identifying all of these issues, but then kind of then what? What can we offer them that's actually practical and helpful? And so um, we were fortunate that this Victims of Crime Act funding was being offered and folks conceived of this project that um, anyone who qualified for adult protective services sir, services could then be a client of this project. And so we've, we were founded to be a concrete resource for folks experiencing abuse, neglect and exploitation um, as a way of remedying issues that adult protective services couldn't solve. So when we went around introducing ourselves um, when the project started this Kim's case was one of the cases where they're like, oh man, I've had this on my desk. I've got a case for you. I didn't know what to do with it. Um, and so Kim is, is one of those cases. She had been um, locked in the basement of her own home um, when some relatives moved in. They were living off of her benefits. Kim has um, some cognitive um, impairment. She was called every word you can imagine. Someone might be called um, they threatened to slice her with a butcher knife and burn her with a cigarette at the stove. And uh, they literally tied the door to her bedroom to the banister of the basement stairs so she couldn't get out. Um, and it's just, it's horrible. And unfortunately, we have many Kims that we've um, had the privilege of assisting. So uh, we, we partner with Adult Protective Services and that network has grown. We partner with area agencies on aging because they obviously serve older adults and have hotlines, information lines where they can connect folks to us if it seems appropriate. We work with what we call councils on aging, which are county. Uh, each county has one of those that helps older adults. They're a great resource for transportation, outreach. Um, they have great relationships in rural communities, which is important to us. Uh, we partner with financial institutions, um, the banks up here have a monthly breakfast where they talk about ATM skimmers and all kinds of bank stuff, but they also invite us, law enforcement and adult protective services, where we can talk about, you know, how do I get bank records for a client who's being financially exploited? You know, like how can we work together to make this better? Or how can I educate your tellers? So if they see something funny at the window regarding a power of attorney, that they, that they know what to look for and then who to call or who to refer the, the bank member to to get to get help. Um, we work with law enforcement. We get lots of referrals from the front desk of police stations when people walk in. Um, we work with neuropsychologists, especially in our guardianship cases, to get uh, medical evaluations that are meaningful for our clients. Um, we've recently been working with special education professionals. We've had a lot of um, clients who are like 19 to 22 who are being abused by parents and the teachers and special education professionals at school are the ones to recognize that abuse and report it. Um, and then with medical professionals, we obviously work with you all um, in guardianship cases, but we, we are more and more relying on uh, medical professionals because our clients, um, like so many uh, survivors of violence are isolated. And with older adults, that's even more difficult because many of them also have mobility issues and um, isolation is, is easier. They depend on other folks for rides or they, you know, if you take away their walker, they can't move from one room of the house to another or you take away their hearing um, device or their glasses, you know, you can't see or you can't hear. Um, but we find that most folks, even if they're being isolated, still go to the doctor. And so that is a place where uh, we hope clients can talk in a private environment one-on-one -on -one 
and and be asked and get help um, identifying whether they're being abused. Um, and and just to to say that you know the the survey the studies show that folks older adults who experience abuse neglect and exploitation have a three hundred percent higher risk of death. Like this is a major health issue for older adults. Um, so it's um, we really welcome collaboration with the medical partners. Uh, next slide. So um, we do have one thing coming up, which is kind of like WebMD for legal services um, called the legal, sorry, next slide, legal risk detector. And um, it will, it's a website that any community partner can use to go through with a client to help identify whether they have a legal need. And then it provides the opportunity for a referral to legal services. Um, so we're excited to, to bring that out and we hope it will increase collaboration and also provide more access to folks in rural areas um, to our services. But um, uh, then you can actually go two slides ahead, please. The, the main thing is that there's, for us, there's no wrong way in. Like whether you come through an MLP or a call line, like you have access to any attorney in our organization, whether it's LAVA or not, to have your legal need met. I get referrals from the MLP attorneys to handle elder abuse cases and vice versa. So it's really for us, the way our system is set up a way in the door and it doesn't matter how you get in the door, you'll get what you need. Um, and this slide just shows some ways that we rely on community partners. You're often the ones in the home or in the clinic um, to help identify who's controlling a situation. Are they being isolated? Has their appearance changed? Um, and then you can provide referrals. You're the trusted eyewitnesses. You know, people trust uh, EMTs and doctors more than they trust police officers or others. So when you're on the witness stand, it means a whole lot more um, than some other witnesses. And, and these partnerships help us identify um, systemic issues that we can work together to try to address. And so with that, I will stop talking. Thank you, Jessica. That was really wonderful. I, um, I think someone dropped into the chat the video um, that Jessica mentioned, so make sure and check that out. And then um, also, again, my commercial, invite you all to participate in our learning collaborative in a few weeks to hear more um, about Jessica's work and their project, this idea of no wrong door. How do we set up systems so that um, folks can get what they need regardless of by which entry point they find, ourselves, find themselves um, connected to services. So um, on the Learning Collaborative, just want to mention that it's coming up, starting our first one will be in May. It'll be a series of four separate sessions. You can register for it. Um, there's a link there in the, um, in the slides for registering, and I believe it was just dropped in the chat as well. So um, sign up for it, register, and you'll have an opportunity to hear more from our different speakers, um, ask questions, um, problem solve together, um, think through ways that, you know, so much of what we talked about today was about innovation. Think through the ways that innovation can be, um, you know, used as to, to think about the different justice gaps and um, service quandaries that I, we know you all are experiencing in your work. Um, and feel free to reach out if you have questions too about, about the learning collaborative. They will be on May 5th, 12th, 19th, and 26th. Um, so please sign up. Next slide. And um, I, just to include, we're concluding our, our webinar today. I, I just want to share, I know we didn't have time for questions today, but um, I, we will certainly in the learning collaboratives to come. Want to thank our presenters today. We are across four time zones. So we are really <laughs> excited about the re representation and time zone representation that exists in our webinar today and that we were able to hear from so many models across the country and, and look forward to hearing more from you all and the work that you're doing as well. Um, there's an evaluation link that Camila just dropped in the chat. Please fill it out. It really helps us with our programming and um, look forward to hearing more from you all soon. And thank you all to our presenters again.